So good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody joining this event. Very much looking forward to it. So we are delighted to be here today to discuss the Lancet Global Health Commission on Financing Primary Health Care, putting people at the center with our distinguished panel. I'm Fiona Samuels. I'm a senior research fellow at ODI. I'm also an honorary associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And at ODI, I convene much of our work on health along with Tom Hart, my colleague here and others at ODI. So we're gonna start with an overview of the findings of the commission from Cara Hansen, who is the team leader of the commission at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Following Cara's presentation, we will have short presentations on three of the case studies that the commission drew on from Brazil, Ghana, and the Philippines. We will then turn to my colleague, Tom Hart, for comments on some of the public financing aspects in financing primary health care. And then we will have plenty of time for qu questions and answers at the end. But first over to Cara. So Cara is professor of health systems economics, and she's also Dean of the Faculty of Public Health and Policy at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. We are really delighted to have her here at ODI, also given that her first job was an ODI fellow in the Ministry of Health in Swaziland. So with that, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Kara. Go ahead, Kara, and please do share your screen. Hey, thank you so much, Fiona, and thank you to ODI for hosting us. Um, as Fiona said, I, my very first job was linked to ODI. I was an ODI fellow in the late 1980s. So um, ODI have always been a really, um, a really key um, organization that I like to connect with. Am I showing the right thing? Excellent. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to start by giving you uh, an overview of the commission and its findings. Um, I think this audience doesn't need much introduction to the challenge of, um, of primary health care, that it's, it's the basis for all wealth functioning health systems. It's also the foundation of universal health coverage, but that PHC is often underfunded and often um, funded with, with less, than, um, less than effective financing arrangements more generally. And that can lead to inefficient and poorly performing services, to a lack of financial protection for users and to inequalities in access to care. On top of that, COVID has created a broader crisis, both a health crisis and a fiscal crisis. And um, those of us uh, both in the high income world and in the low and middle income country world are seeing the real crunches in, in public expenditure. Um, and it seems like a really good moment to be highlighting to our decision makers the dangers that societies face if they don't have a well-functioning PHC system that protects everyone. So what we were setting out to do in this commission was to gather new evidence on the levels and patterns of global health expenditure and particularly expenditure on primary health care, and then to analyze the key challenges faced in financing PHC, identifying areas of, of proven or promising practice across countries that would support PHC across the health financing functions, and then to try to identify some actionable policies that, um, that would support low and middle income countries country governments in raising and allocating and channeling resources to primary health care. We framed our report around uh, the key health financing functions. So those of you who come from the health financing world will recognize these. This is the mobilization of revenue uh, and its pooling the allocation of resources for PHC, and then kind of within the broad category of purchasing, we were interested particularly in how PHC providers are paid. But we felt from the outset that it was important to rest this analysis of financing functions on the foundation of understanding the political, uh, social and economic context. We did lots of things in the commission in terms of data analysis and literature review, but one of the most valuable exercises for the commission was to, um, to, to undertake case studies. Um, 
And these case studies were kind of scattered among these health financing functions. Some of the case studies focused on a particular function and others kind of straddled more than one. But I'm particularly happy today that for this presentation, we have colleagues from Ghana and the Philippines and from Brazil who were all authors of case studies that fed into the report. So a few bits of data to start. The first is about the absolute levels of expenditure on PHC. Now we, um, we worked with the Global Health Expenditure Database um, figures, but we did some further manipulation of them. One was um, to, to be able to combine the, the Global Health Expenditure Database um, with the OECD database on health on primary health care expenditure to expand the range of countries that we could analyze. And the other was to, I guess, to, to challenge some of the assumptions that are that go into estimating PHC spending. And in particular, uh, we challenged the, um, the inclusion by assumption of 80% of, of all admin costs, um, loading that onto PHC. So our estimates are slightly different from those in the Global Health Expenditure Database, but they're not orders of magnitude different. And I think the key message in this analysis is really clear, which is that that's that government spending on PHC in low and in lower middle income countries is very low at $3 per capita per year in low income countries and 16 in uh, lower middle income countries. Um, in low income countries, that $3 is accompanied by about $8 per capita of donor financing and four times the amount of, um, of out of pocket expenditure as government spending. So if you look, if you were to add all these bars up, you'd see that government is actually a very small share of total spending on PHC. Um, why does the level of spending matter? Uh, the main reason is because it is all, it's well, it, it's uh, it's both correlated with issues of financial protection, but it also correlates with better service coverage. So this is just uh, you know it's a scatter plot looking at the UHC uh, service coverage index, which is one of the indices used to monitor progress towards the um, the UHC SDG. Um, but you can see that there you know the countries that spend more. Uh, actually get higher coverage. Most of the services in that coverage index are actually services that are delivered through PHC. So there's a general upward line here, but also at any given level of spending, if you were to draw a vertical line, you'd see there's actually a lot of variation in the level of coverage that's achieved. And this is really the basis for the, the key argument of the commission, which is that it's important to spend more because of the upward line, uh, but to spend better because of the variation. So countries have shown that they are able to achieve very different levels of coverage with the same level level of spending. And that right away leads us to ask the question, well, what are they doing? What are, what are some countries doing to spend better on PHC? So a couple of key findings, I'm not going to present the, all of the report, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things, just very briefly on the mobilization and, and pooling of funds that um, that spending enough on PHC is, is critical, but that spending on PHC is a, is a subset of total health spending. And the question of how much government spend on health is, is probably the most important one. So it's thinking about what is the overall budget envelope for governments? How much do they choose to spend on health? And how much from that is spent on PHC? We argued based on evidence from uh, around the world, actually, that it is possible to increase total health expenditure by increasing national budgets. And this should predominantly rely on increased taxation. But there is scope for borrowing, but that's really not sustainable. The prospects for increased aid spending are somewhat limited. Um, and therefore that, you know, that generating funds from tax revenue is not just important and desirable, but also possible. And that in turn will feed into the amount of money that's available into health if governments prioritize health and to PHC to the extent that governments prioritize PHC. The biggest, the, the most relevant part of our report for today's discussion is really about how, how governments allocate resources to PHC. And we argue in the report that there's a range of policy levers that governments can use to channel and protect resources for PHC until they reach frontline providers. And these involve how budgets are formulated, how budgets are executed, and how services are delivered. 
We would also argue that in decentralized systems, which is the case for all of the systems we're looking at, um, at today, that, that allocations to PHC at the decentralized level are even less visible. And so that more policy tools might be needed to increase and track expenditures on PHC. Countries will apply many of these tools at the same time, and almost all of them require a really clear definition of PHC. And furthermore, that it's, uh, it's got to be clear where in the Ministry of Health responsibility for budgeting and planning for PHC lies in order to both improve accountability, but also to increase uh, political support for PHC. We also argue in the report that this budget allocation process requires a range of capacities that often need to be strengthened for it to work well. So this is um, the, the sorts of public financial management capacities that are very familiar to the ODI audience, thinking about budgets, thinking about budget processes, being able to pool funds under a single budget and budget rules, and also to be able to align the budget with policy objectives, but also, um, a range of purchasing tools as well as so having a functional referral system and gatekeeping and the appropriate levels of autonomy, flexibility in procurement rules, and basically just good management capacity at all levels of the health system to be able to pull these, these different tools together to really prioritize PHC in national budgets and then make sure that the money doesn't drift off as it heads towards PHC providers. Another, uh, we're particularly interested in provider payment, not just because it sets the incentives for providers, but also uh, because it's also a means of, of protecting resources and you know, so of making sure that resources actually meet provider, um, reach providers. Um, so PHC providers are commonly paid either through input-based budgets, through fee-for-service, through capitation, or um, sometimes through performance-based management. But we argue in the report that some form of population-based or capitation payment systems uh, create both the strongest incentives for providers to deliver PHC, but they're also really the best way to, to, to fund PHC because they're based on notions of equity. They start with an equal fixed payment per person, um, that those amounts can be adjusted based on health needs, targeting greater resources to those who are in greater need. It also, it's very PHC, um, PHC friendly because it, it pays providers to manage population health and to prioritize health promotion and prevention. But importantly, it also provides a predictable and a stable revenue stream for PHC providers. So the on provider payment, uh, we our core argument is that countries should move towards a system where capitation is at the core and then other forms of payment are used to, to complement that and to compensate in a way for some of the downsides sides of capitation, um, which those who are familiar with this literature will know that there can be a tendency to under provide. So by adding to that some additional fee for service or performance based payment, it's possible to make up for those shortcomings. But those other things should be around the edges of a core of um, a core of, uh, of capitation based financing. And that's what we mean by blended. So we use this term blended. The idea is that, you, that your payment system should be a mixed one, um, but that blend can be built up over time. So we charted in the report uh, a pathway towards a more strategic provider payment system that would both drive and support PHC. And that it kind of moves on this developmental trajectory. So um, you might be starting with the status quo of either input-based budgets or fee-for-service, but this in the first instance could shift to something that's uh, more simple capitation, have this then adjusted by differences in population health need, and then gradually add on some of these other payment mechanisms, you know, pay for performance or, um, or fee for service type payments to add on towards uh, when the rest of the system is functioning well. 
And then uh, what we also track in this picture is the sorts of capacities that are needed for this to be enabled. So, um, so governments need to be thinking about at the same time, how do you strengthen information systems and enable them to collect and process and, and interpret the data needed to administer these payment systems, to increase purchaser capacity, to think about provider autonomy, and then um, all of this kind of underpinned by a strong and flexible public financial management system. So just to skip on then to our final recommendations, the first is we conclude that there are some attributes of people-centered financing for PHC that countries should aspire to. So one is that, um, that spending on PHC should primarily come from government spends that are government spending that is that is gathered, collected through tax revenue. That pooling arrangement, so whether this is social insurance or whether that pooling function is achieved through a tax funded system, that pooling arrangements should always cover PHC and cover PHC first. Uh, that resources should be allocated equitably across different levels of service delivery, and they should be protected until they, until they reach service providers and patients, and that they should be paid to providers through a blended provider payment system that has capitation at its core. We had a number of other recommendations as well that, um, that this undertaking is, is one that requires a whole of government approach. Uh, and by that, we mean you know, both working closely with the Ministry of Finance to secure budget allocations to health and, with, and also to, to review public financial management arrangements, but also thinking quite hard about other sectors and also about decentralized authorities and the role of, um, of state or provincial governments in federal systems. Something I haven't talked about at all, uh, but which is highly relevant is that um, these technical strategies we talk about need to be underpinned by a really good understanding of the social and economic and political conditions. And there's a, a, a very rich section of our report that spells out how in different country contexts there have been really effective um, political strategies for driving a system towards a PHC focus. And the last one is, is quite a specific technical recommendation, which is around the way that PHC expenditure data are collected and classified and reported. But we do argue that the most important thing here is that countries should settle on their own definition of PHC and use that definition to track their own progress towards increased allocations. So I'll just close by recognizing uh, the commissioners who contributed to this report over a, a really challenging two years of entirely online communications. I'm grateful to all of them for the, the hard work and the insights that they provided. And then to acknowledge our, our funder and others who have um, contributed to this undertaking. So thanks very much, Fiona. Thank you, Cara, very much for so eloquently taking us through a very complex and deep um, report that all of you produced. And just to mention that I actually I looked at the executive summary in the briefing and I found them really very helpful in kind of providing a, a snapshot of, of, of the key findings. Before I move on, I just wanted to mention to um, all participants that please feel free to post questions in the Q&A box. I see some people have already started doing so and we'll endeavor to answer them at the end. But please also panelists and participants, please feel free to respond to the questions that are being put in the Q&A box so we can have a kind of interactive discussion as we proceed. So now I'm, I'm going to hear from some of the case studies that the commission drew on. And I'm delighted that the authors are here to present them. So I'm first going to present the authors and then I'm going to hand over to them one by one to, to present their, their, their findings. So firstly, we have Adriano Masuda. He's a professor at the Fundación Getulio Vargas in Sao Paulo School of Business Administration in Brazil. He is a medical doctor and he also holds a PhD in health policy and planning. He also worked as a physician and also as a health official in Curitiba and at the National Ministry of Health. Following him, we will have Sister Eugenia Amporfo, who is an associate professor in the Department of Economics at Kwame Nkrumah University of Social Science and Technology in Kumasi, Ghana. She holds a PhD in economics from Simon Fraser University, and her research in health economics includes strategic pur purchasing, fo focusing on healthcare financing and physician reimbursement, equity and policy and valuation. Last but not least, we have Lisa Lagrada Rombawa, 
who is president of GECC Development Services in the Philippines. She started her career as a municipal health officer in Palawan. She has worked at the Department of Health as division chief in health policy and planning and at the Philippines Health Insurance Corporation as head of executive staff and group vice president. She now works with global organization development partners and Philippine government agencies on health fi financing reforms, governance in health and quality assurance. She's also a senior fellow at the Results for Development Institute. So we have a fantastic panel of speakers. So now I'm gonna um, go straight to, um, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes. Go straight to Adriano for his presentation on primary healthcare financing in Brazil. So over to you, Adriano, please do share your screen. So thank you, Fiona. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be part of this event. Uh, I would like also to thank and congratulate Chiara and all the Lancet commissioners for the brilliant uh, document produced on financing primary care. Uh, it was a, a great pleasure to be part of this initiative uh, and a very enormous responsibility to uh, write the uh, Brazil case study because of the, how uh, the Brazilian experience on primary care was important. And also because of the moment that we are uh, live in Brazil with a very challenging time. So I uh, firstly, I think what we need to, to highlight is that primary care was the main way to achieve universal health cover as a part of the health system reform. So it was not a, a, a vertical or a separate problem, it's a central part of the health system reform in Brazil. The health system in Brazil uh, was based on constitutional principles on universal high to, to health, integrality and comprehensiveness. So it's not only universal, it's universal plus uh, in, uh, integrality, decentralization to the municipal level, and social participation. These uh, health systems reform uh, was followed by implementation of changes in the health system governance and financing arrangements uh, to support the municipalization in the 1990s with decentralization of federal uh, responsibilities and financial resources to states and mainly to the municipal governments to receive these health system responsibilities. Since the uh, 2000, several initiatives on organization of uh, health regions uh, was implemented. And following these arrangements, uh, primary health care policies uh, was implemented uh, over time. Firstly, the family health program in 1990s, and then federal financing to support the implementation of these uh, uh, programs, and then followed by several national policies. So because of that, uh, the primary care uh, experience in Brazil is very strong. However, there are several fragilities that is fragilities of the health systems. Firstly, is the public underfinancing. So Brazil is a very unequal country uh, where only 42% of the health uh, budget is public and 58% is private. Private, 25% uh, out, uh, 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 out of pocket expenditure and the other part, and there's a strong uh, uh, private insurance. Another fragility is the fragility of the organization of health regions. So the municipalities are uh, not organized uh, in the regions uh, sufficiently to work as, as a region. And because of that, we have uh, an important problem of unequal uh, allocation of resources. In primary care, the federal level is responsible for 33% of the expenditures and the municipalities is responsible for 61%. And in municipalities, we have five 
more than 5,000 municipalities with a very different situation of fiscal conditions and technical capacities. So uh, because of that, we have a strong primary care in a system with uh, important fragilities. Uh, here, uh, I want to, to show how the financing arrangements for primary care work in Brazil. So it's a composition of federal incentives plus municipal own resources. So uh, the federal uh, government, uh, states, the government and municipal government collect taxes uh, and they need to spend uh, 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 at least a part of their uh, budget on health. For primary care, we have a, a federal fund uh, from 1998 until 2020, uh, based on a fixed component, the population component, uh, that's around 23 to 28 dollars per capita, and a, variab a variable component based on the number of family health strategy teams. So this uh, federal funding is transferred to the municipalities, and the municipalities need uh, uh, to provide uh, health staff, uh, infrastructure, and supply. Uh, so this organization was, was very important for the, the, the federal government encourage municipalities uh, to provide the family health strategy that is based on multi-professional teams composed of a doctor, a nurse, nurse assistant, and community health workers to deliver a comprehensive range of actions uh, for 2,000 to 4,000 people of a defined uh, geographic area. Uh, so uh, the, the policy design and implementation uh, in the decentralized health system was very interesting to see how the negotiation and learning process was permanently happened. Uh, so uh, local initiatives, for example, the family health strategy was based on, firstly, on, on, on local initiatives, then auxiliary programs to support the family health strategy was also developed on, on local initiatives, and also uh, more currently an in integration of primary care into health networks. These local experience became national policies. So the national policies, <clears throat> Uh, develop national guidelines and federal incentives to be implemented by municipalities uh, across the country. So national, uh, these national policies are implemented, but in a situation of high uh, regional diversity, social economic inequalities, and with a lack of regional support. So because of that, uh, we need to negotiate and, and learn to improve the capacity of delivering uh, uh, primary care. So <clears throat> from 1998 to 2020, uh, the number of family health teams increased over time, uh, increased the co population covered by, by, by uh, uh, the family health strategy teams, and also uh, auxiliary programs were implemented, such as oral health, uh, specialist, specialized teams for support the primary care delivery, uh, and because of, and, and with that, we uh, increased coverage uh, from 4% to 60, 62% of population by family care teams. These, uh, 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 because of that, uh, we have, we could see better access and utilization of health services, increase of vaccination, antenatal care, declines in infant mortality and avoidable hospitalization, and also reduction of social and racial inequalities. However, barriers to uh, uh, increase expansion still exist, uh, such as shortage of professionals, mainly doctors, budget constraints in the municipalities, availability uh, of, uh, uh, in, in remoteness areas, and also the availability of private insurance in the municipalities is something that <clears throat> uh, is a barrier to have a, more, a higher uh, uh, coverage of primary care teams. Uh, something that was very innovative that uh, we published uh, in the, the, the case study 
is to see the effect of health find of health spending and the source of funding on uh, primary care and we try to measure the effects of the spending on services and access and also in outcomes on inf uh, effects on infant mortality and what we observed is that the direct the direct funding uh, uh, from primary care for primary care from the federal government to the municipalities called the public transfers was the most important uh, financing to impact on increased primary care coverage, increased access and reduction of infant mortality, then other types of federal transfers, and also from own resources from the municipalities. So these highlight the importance of this federal incentive target to primary care to the municipalities to uh, improve outcomes. Uh, 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 however, uh, uh, we are uh, crossing over an important challenge in time. We, uh, 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 the uh, awakening of primary care in the context of fiscal austerity policies that was introduced uh, in 2016 after a political and economical crisis. In 2019, the, this primary care mechanism was replaced by a risk adjusted capitation and performance evaluation, not to pay the providers, but to calculate the intergovernment transfers for the municipalities to the, for the federal government to the municipalities. So the, the federal incentive is not more universal, but is only for who is uh, registered by family health teams. And this is a problem. This, uh, uh, reduce the capacity and the, the of the the, the help the, the new the, of, of the system. The PAB arrangement was crucial for creating a stable source of funds for primary care, and losing it may provoke undesirable fluctuations in, in primary care financing. So what we what we uh, the, the, mo the most recent data is showing a shifting. Uh, in, in access from primary care to emergency services. From 1998 into 2013, we uh, could see the increase of access on medical appointments and the, the medical appointments was based on primary care sources. From, 19, from 2013 to 2019, the, the access to primary care reduced importantly and increased uh, procedures uh, on primary care. So uh, after all these uh, 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 achievements uh, that we could see over the 30 years of the Brazilian health system reform with the implementation of, 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 of a strong primary care, currently uh, we are <clears throat> crossing over this uh, very uh, challenging situation. So uh, just to give a, a brief overview on, on, on the Brazil, uh, uh, context, and I'm happy to to uh, see for the, the questions. Thank you so much, Adriano. That was really fascinating, um, bringing kind of the ground realities in you know into into these issues. You know what is really happening on the ground. So I found that really fascinating. Um, now we're going to move on to Sister Eugenia, who will present on the challenges experienced in piloting a capitation-based payment system for primary health care in Ghana. Over to you, Eugenia. Please do share your screen. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to add my voice to Andriano in thanking the commission and the organizers for um, inviting us also to participate in this very important um, area and to congratulate them for such a good work done. I think it was a very comprehensive work, and very useful work. Thank you. So I'll just go back to what I'm talking about, capitation in Ghana, Ghana's experience with capitation. And I'll start by looking at the background, healthcare financing in Ghana. Ghana got its independence in 1957. And so healthcare financing started with more of a tax financing method. 
where health facilities, I'm talking mainly, they were mostly public facilities. Um, government would pay salaries and then um, supply funds for capital expenditure and other expenditures. Uh, and so at the point of services, patients didn't have to pay anything. But over time, there were other priorities in the government budget that started drying up you know, the system. And so funds going to facilities started dwindling. And um, in the 1980s, cash and carry system, which is the introduction of user fee um, to the health system. And we know the consequences of that. Um, there was, there was um, increase in uh, a reduction in health utilization. And there was uh, increase in um, health deterioration. Maternal um, rate, death rates started going up and people started dying from treatable diseases. So there was a loud public outcry for change. And in 2003, the National Health Insurance Scheme was introduced. Um, this, this was a political um, a campaign um, promise. It was introduced in 2003, but it started operating in 2005. And the provided payment method that um, um, they started with is the fee for service method. And um, before long, we realized that there was this problem with cost escalation. The costs of claims started going way up. And so there was a need for a change in the provider payment method to ensure sustainability of the scheme. So in 2008, the Ghana Diagnostic Related Group method was introduced and that allowed um, services that were similar to be uh, bundled and paid um, together. That is supposed to curb the, the cost escalation. But over time, because many health facilities facilities didn't provide all services, there were always often the need to unbundle some of the services so that they could um, get the services outside. And that um, started you know, bringing, making it more similar to the fee, fee for service again, the cost started going up. And there was also the problem of upcoding, you know, providers um, giving higher costs you know, um, to services that do not attract high, high fee. And this combined with the complexity of claims processing also led to an increase in the cost. And so there was a need for a change again, either look at the DGLD again, or come up with a new method of uh, provided uh, payments. And so Ghana decided to go for a new method of provider payment, and that is the capitation, and decided to um, pilot it in the Ashanti region. So when we talk about capitation, as um, it was clearly explained um, by Kara, uh, under the capitation method, the providers will be assigned, either they will be assigned or they will be allowed to, um, to be selected by enrollees in the case of an, an insurance team or the population um, for treatment. So when you are sick, this is where you go. And they receive a fixed fee per enrollee whether the enrollee uses a health facility or not during a given period. And then in Ghana's case, um, the fixed fee was paid on a monthly basis. So this was piloted in January 2012 um, in the Ashanti region. That is where I come, that's where I'm speaking from, the Ashanti region of Ghana. But in 2017, it was um, suspended. But it was supposed to be piloted for one or two years, but it, it dragged on till 2017 when it was suspended. And basically the reason for the introduction of this scheme, as I've already explained, is to improve efficiency in the in-service provision and create some incentive for health, facil um, health providers to minimize costs and to improve the quality of care. And it covered, the capitation services covered all primary care um, services but um, some were eliminated such as maternal care. Maternal care was removed and um, removed because the services were also provided by other health facilities like maternity homes, um, which are not likely to be selected by, um, by enrollees and they will be you know, drawn out of business. So they were allowed to just um, operate and take care of um, maternal care and that was paid under the DGRD. And 
um, medicines were also removed from the, um, the list. And that, that fell under the fee for service um, method of payments. Now, looking at the designing of capitation, um, they look at seven main components, technical components. First, we look at the pack, uh, package of services that were covered by the scheme, as I have already um, explained. These are all um, prim defined primary healthcare um, services, with the exception of those that were eliminated. And all the providers um, that were accredited by the National Health Insurance were allowed um, to provide. And under the capitation um, scheme, um, we have the, what we call PPP, preferred primary, um, primary provider. And so they were supposed to act as a preferred primary provider for um, the method of payment. And um, for the computation of the base rate, we use what we call the capital, the base per capita rate. And under that, the, the technical team just compute, took the total expenditure in, um, for treating all the diseases that are um, selected for a given period and divided it by the number of um, people and release. That is how they're able to compute the capitation, uh, the capitation rate or the base per capita rate. In addition, they were supposed to make adjustment, coefficient adjustment. They have to take into account the fact that some people may be sicker than others, um, so that um, some facilities that select such um, people will not be, uh, or get selected by such um, people will not be disadvantaged. But there was not enough data to do that kind of um, computation. So that was given up. And um, all enrollees of the NHIA in the region were supposed to be part of the capitation. So you are allowed to select three facilities and um, you can change your facility after three, after six months, if you're not happy with the services. This is to, to motivate providers to improve the quality of care to, in order to maintain their, um, their clients. And of course, they also had the financial management and reporting system to help um, NHIA know what is going on and how to pay them. And they had a quality monitoring system as well. Um, so what worked? Um, that is a big question. Um, when it comes to capitation, there's been a lot of studies on that. And the, we get some positive um, effects here and there. Um, but basically, um, the, the positive impacts have been marginal. You know, some, have re some studies have reported um, a reduction in utilization of healthcare, and that represents better allocation of resources because overutilization represents waste of resources. So if there is improvement, some, even if it's marginal, improvement in um, utilization rates, that represents um, marginal cost containment to some extent. And so that is um, positive. And there are also reports of cases in which some providers try to um, invest in the health of their clients. And that is also, but that is also very marginal. There were a few challenges that um, the, the, the scheme faced. And one of these is political um, powers. By political powers, I'm looking first at the, the pilot area that happened to be a very controversial region because it is the stronghold of the opposition political party. And it was that party that introduced um, the method of um, the scheme itself, the national health insurance. And so there, it was taken with a pinch of salt. People were very suspicious because of comments that were made that they, 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 they're trying to destroy the scheme. It wasn't well received um, as, as a result. In addition to that, providers were not happy with the, with the, with the fee, the, the per capita rate, they thought it was too low because they were not able to convince them or to even differentiate between an encounter cost versus per capita cost. And so they kept saying that it was too low, the cost was way below the cost of treatment, but it was not just the cost of treatment, it was just whether the person comes for treatment or not, you're still getting this payment. So that the, the cost providers were not happy with it. They also you know, were able to bargain and um, change a lot of the conditions. And in the process, 
reduce the risk sharing components of capitation. They raised it. They were able to raise the capitation rates. You know, so that the risk component fell back to NHIA. The Pharmacy um, Association of Ghana um, said that the inclusion of medicines in the package will not favor community pharmacy shops. And so um, they should not include uh, pharmacy. And there was a lot of agitation. So in the end, pharmacy uh, medicines had to be removed from the package. Um, so these, you know, policies, these factors actually would change a little bit, not even a little bit, the ability of the scheme or the method of payment to, to reduce um, costs and improve efficiency. And there was inadequate education of the populace, even though there was some effort from the NHRA to educate the populace, but it was too late. You know, people had, or minds had already been um, um, set negatively and providers were also able to convince the populace that the capitation method is a bad deal. And that plus the political um, background didn't work at all. There was also lack of trust in the NHIA. NHIA has been notorious when it comes to the payment of um, claims. It always delays, and sometimes delays for a long time. There's been cases in which providers threaten to even withdraw services. Um, and so people didn't, um, providers didn't really trust that NHIA would pay before um, or at the beginning of the period as promised according to capitation. And in fact, there were cases in which NHIA couldn't pay on time. And that, that um, was a big problem that motivated providers to even start charging um, user fee to patients. Um, to be able to get the capitation to work, um, you need a good cage keeper system. And at the point of implementation, the planning, we did not, the health system didn't have that kind of cage keeper system. So we needed to do mapping of all the health facilities and get their capacities and to be able to come up with a good cage keeper system. We needed a lot of money to be able to do that. And that wasn't available. That delayed the implementation, the beginning of the implementation. And that also meant that um, some of the um, important factors had to be under the capitation method, um, had to be dropped, like um, group practice, group PPP had to be dropped because it was too expensive to do that. And even when they collected the data, they couldn't analyze the data well because they needed more funds to be able to do that. And that was um, another important challenge. So what were some of the lessons learned? Um, it's important that um, we include all stakeholders from the very beginning of the planning to ensure that um, not only do you have to get representatives of these um, stakeholders, you also have to come out and educate, get make sure that the group is also well educated. Providers, we're talking about providers, the populace, um, and all those that are involved. And of course, pharmaceuticals as well. And um, there is also the need for adequate budget. That is very important. You need time and you need the adequate budget to be able to ensure and to develop a good gatekeeper system. And you also need good monitoring and evaluation system to make sure that it was one of the important indicators that um, Ghana was supposed to use was referral rates. And we need data, you need to be collecting the data to be able to do that. And that was a, a challenge in the process. So, so there isn't much with regard to the, the impact of the capitation with regard to um, its reduction um, in, with, uh, in utilization in general and its ability to reduce costs and to improve the quality of care. Um, another very important um, lesson is the political powers is very important and should not be taken for granted at all. So in, in sum, this is basically what I have to share about Ghana and the capitation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sister Eugenia. That was really fascinating. I learned a lot about capitation and also the struggles in implementing it and how in a way, as you were saying, you know, it gets hijacked by politics very easily and all the more reason why we need to work on the social and political determinants of health from the very start, something that we do a lot at ODI. So now I'm going to hand over to Liesl, 
who will present on the date on the decentralized system of primary health care financing in the Philippines. Over to you, Liesl. Thank you. Please unmute yourself, Liesl. Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all. And um, thank you for this opportunity to share our findings on how primary health care is being financed in the Philippines. Uh, while our case uh, study estimated how much is being spent on primary care and what are the sources of these funds, uh, this presentation is, uh, fo will focus more on how local public primary care providers consolidate various sources of funds for primary care. Before I uh, move on, I would just like to thank uh, my collaborators, Dr. Joyce and Tina and um, Mr. Eman Gloria, and to echo my co-panelists in thanking uh, the Landsat Commission for um, the opportunity to work on this um, part of our health sector. Okay, um, this slide provides the context of our study. The Philippine healthcare system is default. Uh, it has been developed since 1991. So uh, the um, hospitals, including the provincial and the uh, district uh, district hospitals, are um, devolved to provincial government, while the primary care services are devolved to city health, city government, and municipal government. So they. Uh, manage the city health offices and municipal health offices, respectively. So currently, there are 81 provinces, 146 cities, and 1,488 municipalities. So um, between the cities and uh, municipal uh, governments, uh, we have so many number of uh, local government authorities um, that plan for budget for and implement primary health care. So to allow, uh, to enable these local government units to deliver these devolved services, they were given 40% share of the national revenues collected by the national government. But recently, and this uh, policy will be implemented this year, uh, LGUs will have a 55% increase in their internal revenue allocation. And uh, on average, each LGU would have an increase of 27% of their share from the national uh, government. So we are, uh, we focused in this study at the municipal health office level under the municipal government. Okay, so this is how financing flows for primary health care in the Philippines. So at the, the um, health system delivery is not only fragmented, how it is financed is also fragmented. So um, LGUs, aside from their share from the national government revenues can also generate their own uh, local taxes. And across LGUs, um, on average, they allocate about 7% of their budget to their health offices. And PhilHealth, established in 1995, also provides another source of funds for the primary care providers, and they are paid through capitation for uh, primary care services. It's a package of uh, uh, services that is defined by PhilHealth or through case payment. For example, PhilHealth pays a certain amount uh, to deliver a baby and to provide care for maternal and newborn. Uh, DOH, on the other hand, despite the devolution, also provides global budget for in-kind support to LGUs. The local government code actually allows for it, you know, and later on we will see 
how this is uh, channeled to the local government unit and what is the basis for such global budget or in-kind support. Um, the National Health Accounts of the Philippines uh, estimated that about 44% uh, of the current health expenditure comes from out of pocket. So individuals at the local level also face user fees for services that can be uh, determined by the municipal health office. For example, uh, they would charge fees for laboratory or sanitary permits. So it's a combination of um, clinical care charges or fees and public health function uh, fees, like for example, sanitary permits. Also, we found out in our, uh, uh, in, in talking with the municipal health offices that they also tap on uh, private sector uh, to augment their, uh, their finances or funding for uh, public or primary health services that they that are remain unfunded. Okay, so as we can see, there are various ways by which all these sources of funds flow through at the municipal health office. So the primary care provider, as I, I uh, mentioned earlier, is the primary uh, is the municipal health office uh, headed by the municipal health officer, a medical doctor, and. Um, he or she manages the office, uh, plans for, for uh, prepares the plan, and uh, requests for the budget. So uh, for the funds that come from PhilHealth, the Municipal Health Office also serves as the uh, fund administrator. If that is set up at the local level, because it would require um, a policy, a local policy to create that trust fund to receive field health payments. Otherwise, field health payments would go into the general fund and will be redistributed across uh, the LGU services. So what does, what, what are being funded from these various uh, uh, sources of funds? The public health services, for which a uh, municipal health office is mandated to deliver. Field health or the specific packages that field health pays for. And before I forget, I have to um, emphasize that field health only pays those that are accredited. Not all municipal health offices are accredited by field health. They have to apply for it and be, you know, be assessed if they are capable of providing the various um, benefit packages that we'll have to pay for. And finally, um, these funds also pay for the local initi locally initiated health care or health services that the municipal health office uh, design or create uh, based on you know, the health needs of the population. Again, I'd like to emphasize that this study was um, done prior to the implementation of Mandana's doctrine. So what does that uh, implicate, uh, imply in this uh, financing flow? The flow that, come, that is coming from the OH, if we look at it after the Mandana's doctrine is implemented, will become different. Because uh, before the implementation of Mandana's, the OH um, spends about um, 16 percent of its budget for health facilities enhancement program, which also includes the upgrading and construction of primary health care, primary health facilities uh, across the country. It also funds equipment that would uh, provide, uh, en uh, ensure that these primary health fa facilities can deliver the various services that they are expected to do. Also, uh, the Department of Health deploys critical health uh, personnel in LGUs. So that's, and this uh, 
HRH program accounts for about 8 to 10 percent of, of the DOH budget. And these two critical line items are devolved now under the Mandanas doctrine. Okay. So uh, with these various uh, sources of funds and various mechanisms by which the MHO receives them, uh, how do they actually consolidate uh, these funds? Uh, the critical uh, process is the planning. Um, every year, municipal governments go through annual, annual investment planning or annual, or they prepare the annual investment program where various departments of the local government unit propose uh, their budget. Uh, of course, the municipal health officer prepares his or her own plan. And uh, where, you know, um, uh, the MHO negotiates the, uh, for each item in the plan. Uh, during the annual investment planning, the MHOs that we interviewed also indicate that uh, they use funds from other line items to augment their, uh, their uh, budget, especially for those uh, programs that can be charged to other line items. Now, th so they negotiate with other um, department heads. A critical aspect also of annual investment planning is uh, the um, understanding of um, the local chief executive or the mayor on how critical a program, uh, how critical a program is in achieving health outcomes or in responding to a healthcare need. For example, um, one municipal health officer uh, related to us how their mayor actually prioritized um, services in maternal health care after realizing the implication of one maternal death. And that understanding and awareness came through training of the local chief executive. So the prioritization in, the, in, in, in investment planning is uh, a critical uh, aspect in the local uh, planning and budgeting process. The municipal health officer is also asked to uh, submit uh, and uh, contribute to local investment plan for health, which is promoted by the Department of Health. Uh, the Department of Health technically looks at this LIPH as a mechanism to um, identify what LGUs need and uh, where should they focus their in uh, their budget you know, in terms of HRH and uh, health facilities enhancement. Uh, and this uh, local investment plan is supposed to go to, to investment, uh, to provincial annual investment program. But the LIPH is also submitted directly to the Department of Health regional offices. So uh, while it is expected that the LIPH should uh, influence the health plan of the province, um, because it is uh, critical also for DOH to, to ensure that these, are, these requests are integrated in the DOH plan, they get it directly from the provincial health offices. So from the regional offices, uh, you know, these plans and uh, are consolidated as national expenditure program, the budget proposal from the national agency agencies, and this become the general appropriations. So if you, uh, we, we can see that, you know, the the planning and budgeting process is quite uh, tedious, and um, the uh, the municipal health officer has to ensure that 
the needs of the health needs are captured actually in the municipal health plan. What happens if uh, there are unfunded unfunded items in the in the plan once they get the municipal budget? Uh, they would uh, still keep it there because uh, by the succeeding year, if there are savings, they would have um, supplemental budget and uh, the, the budget committee would look at those unfunded programs, unfunded FAP uh, pro, um, programs, activities, and plans submitted to them by different departments in the local government. Sorry, Lisa, oh, we uh, need to wrap up quite quickly okay. now. So please right. do Just, come okay. to the end now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Fiona. And then now we have the Universal Healthcare Act which requires organizing the primary care provider network and which would involve you know, a public, private, or a mix of primary care providers and all municipalities within a province should participate. That's the intention of the law. And um, in, this should be funded by the special health fund, which is a pooled and uh, health resources in the entire province, which would include all resources that I have mentioned from Peel Health, from their own budget, from uh, LGU grant. Now, so what are the challenges now? We have enabling laws and policies in place, as I have described the local investment planning, uh, but it has not been considered as mandatory or, or effective. So, because they can still get Fund, uh, funding or support from DOH even without submitting to the LIPH. UHC Act also did not change the autonomy of its LGU, so participation is voluntary. Mandana's doctrine of, increases the LGU budget and hopefully they would increase by the primary health care budget, but it is not assured as there is no mandatory per capita spending on primary care. There is a need to build local capacity in public financial management, as mentioned earlier, you know, uh, increasing the awareness of the uh, elected officials can help in prioritizing primary health care. And among health officers, the capacity to negotiate, uh, to, to uh, raise revenues for their own health system through field health is also uh, a, a need, no? And, like in previous uh, presentations, evidence, robust evidence to demonstrate progress is critical you know, to ensure the confidence of local officials as well as the public that the health system is uh, effective and running. Uh, but there are, you know, wariness in pooling their individual funds into the special health fund because they felt at least the municipal health officers we talked to felt that they would lose their uh, uh, authority to determine how it is. Um, thank you so much and uh, looking forward to our discussion. Over to you, Fiona. Thank you so much, Lisa, and sorry for asking you to wrap up quickly, but thank you so much for presenting this overview of a very complex system in the Philippines. And now, um, if you could sh stop sharing your scheme, Liesl, and okay. hand over to Tom, who will be our discussant. Um, Tom is a senior research fellow in ODI's Development and Public Finance Program, and he leads work on public finance and health. Over to you, Tom. Thank you, Fiona, and thank you to um, all our speakers um, and to all the commissioners on, on the, um, the report as well. I, I think it's a fantastic report, and I just want to start off by highlighting um, two of the, the, the messages which I think are kind of particularly important and have, have um, maybe been neglected. And I think that the first one is the, the focus on the <clears throat> equitable allocation of resources and starting off from a kind of per capita or capitation um, uh, baseline and, and then seeking to kind of add elements to that as, as the complexity and capacity of the financing system um, uh, grows. And I think, you know, th this is obviously important, but I think 
the, the kind of critical importance of it has maybe got lost in some of the um, other kind of health financing debates in recent years, which have um, maybe focused on, on, on other aspects as well. So I think it's great that, that we're coming back to a central focus on this um, and the central focus on the budget as a role um, in allocating as well. And uh, the, the second thing I, that I really liked about the report is that um, I think you were very careful to set out the kind of general attributes that PHC financing should have, and then kind of discuss the various policy tools that um, might or could be used to achieve it. And I think, you know, the case studies that we've just had presented, I think have been very useful at showing, you know, how different instruments are being used in different contexts to try and move towards some of the, the goals that the, the, the commission says. Because I think, you know, too often global reports, international actors kind of promote a single tool or a single silver bullet. So I think, I think setting out to kind of these attributes and then discussing the range of ways that countries um, might employ them or seek to, to use them to move towards these goals, I think is, is a very useful way of conceptualizing, conceptualizing this. Um, now, I want, to, I want to dig a bit deeper into two areas that, that the report covered. Um, you know, my, my background is in public finance and budgeting, so I'm first going to start off with um, looking at kind of some of the questions of how budgeting systems can support or impede the um, PHC financing vision that the Commission sets out. And, and second, building on the case studies that, that we've just heard, the, the reports from um, the Philippines and from Brazil, um, thinking about how primary healthcare financing is managing in decentralized or federal systems. Um, so, so first on, um, on, on budgeting, I think that it's fair to say that there's a, a general view in the kind of health financing community that the traditional line item budget is overly restrictive and not conducive to reaching equity goals or, or um, ensuring that providers have flexibility. Um, but I would also observe that uh, people have been bemoaning the deficiencies of line item budgets for decades. So why does it last? Um, I think it's worth revisiting the observation made uh, by the great um, public administration scholar, um, Aaron Waldavsky, as long ago as 1978, when he said that line item budgeting lasts not because it succeeds brilliantly on every criterion, but because it is simpler, easier, and more controllable. Um, to be useful, a budgetary process should perform tolerably well under all conditions. And I think this is especially noteworthy at a time when many governments, um, many health systems are under considerable fiscal stress um, and, and maintaining expenditure control is unfortunately going to be um, potentially even more of a focus than it, than it has been in recent history. Um, but, but as well as that, I think that the kind of the problems caused by line item budgets um, them, themselves are overstated. I think that the, the issue is not so much the format, the format of the budget itself, but the management arrangements for budgeting in general. Um, so I think we can make a distinction here between how budgets are allocated and how they're managed. And I completely agree with the, the recommendations in the report that we should be looking at things like adjusted capitations for allocating budgets to the delivery organizations, whether that is an individual facility or whether it is um, you know, a, a municipality as in Brazil. But then often, even when you're using that allocation process, often the budget is gonna then be managed by that organization on a line item, uh, on a line item basis. So I think the key issue is making sure that kind of budgetary authority and budgetary management is aligned with service delivery management. So that providers, whether they're a local government or a facility, can um, formulate and manage their own budgets. So any transition away from line item budgeting is not going to help if the budget is remains formulated and controlled by bureaucrats or officials who are remote from the point of service delivery. I, I think that's the real concern. So I think instead of asking, you know, do you have a line item budget? Do you have a program budget? I think the key question I'll to be asking and asking this at each level of the health system, who is responsible for budget formulation? Who is responsible for budget adjustment? And I think those are the kind of critical questions we should be, we should be focusing on, on there. Um, so, now I want to move on to the, the, the challenges of managing PHC financing in federal or decentralized settings. And thank you to Lizelle and Adriano for, for wonderful illustrations of 
of the challenges and some of the successes of, of doing this. And, you know, I think this is, this is a common challenge. Decentralization has been a major reform in many countries over at least the last 30 years. And primary health, you know, often along with um, services like primary education is often one of the first, um, one of the first services or sectors to be, to be devolved. So I think the key challenge in decentralization is combining the, the strengths of national government, where it has, you know, economies of scale and purchasing, um, it has generally much greater technical um, capacity with the strengths of local governments. So with, with the greater local knowledge um, that they have, whether that's tacit or formal and um, accountability of local government. Another recent uh, Lancet Commission, the Lancet Nigeria Commission, spoke about um, aiming, aiming in Nigeria, which is a, a federal country, to have a centrally determined, locally delivered health system. And I think that also echoes the system that, that, that Adriano was outlining with the way that national policies were set and financing was made available to municipalities to, be, to, to um, deliver that. So then if we're talking about a, a, a nationally determined, locally delivered system, we then need to think about the tools that are the policy tools that are available to deliver that. And I think many of these are discussed in the Commission report. So, um, you know, this is not things that the Commission have missed, but I'm just trying to bring them together to think about um, how, how we manage a decentralized systems. And so I think I think the, the, the first one is thinking about norms and standards, which are mentioned and are mentioned as a tool for, for um, pushing funding towards PHC. But I think these are, there's another reason why these are important, which is to ensure that there is a clear delineation of functions between um, levels of government. So there is clarity over what each level of government is expected to finance and is expected to budget for. And I think this relates to one of the questions we've had in the Q&A, which I hope will come up, about how you calculate capitation levels. Because if capitation grants are you know, your, your, your key form of financing at, the, at the, your local government level, then um, you know you've got to be clear about what what exactly that what services what inputs that capitation grant is going to finance, and you can only do that if you're clear about what the respective functions are between between your local governments and your higher levels of government. Um, so I and I think that the second one is um, conditional grants, and you know I think we we heard. Um, from Adriano about the Brazilian case of these and how these were designed around a capitation formula. So I think conditional grants can be designed perfectly in line with, with the kind of reforms that the, the, the um, commission has, has talked about. And, you know, um, I, I've seen um, or been involved in or have colleagues who've been involved in similar efforts to reform these in um, you know, countries in Eastern and Southern Africa, such as Uganda and Malawi, and the commission report notes um, you know, that these have been implemented in, in other places. And, and also that you know, some of the other case studies um, of India that the commission shows, they can also be used to try and crowd in other sources of local revenue or to add governance or performance requirements on, on local governments as well. So I think you know, these are an extremely important tool for thinking about um, about PHC financing. Um, but one thing I would just caution there as well, which is often the temptation for ministries of health can be to try and set up um, a conditional grant system as a parallel financing system, parallel to the main source of financing um, for, for um, local governments. And you know, often this is done from the best of intentions to try and ensure that PHC financing is protected and not diverted. But doing that um, sort of creating these extra parallel systems may protect it, but they can also reduce the effectiveness of spending by increasing bureaucracy. Um, and also they can reduce the local government buy-in to PHC delivery and uh, potential for allocating their own resources as well. So I think, I think you know, we, we always need to be careful of how any conditional grants interacts with the broader sets of, of, of financing that, that may be available to a subnational government. Um, and the last point is one that I really want to emphasize because I think it is often neglected or it, it is weak, um, which is monitoring and information. So the, the, the commissioner's report talked about the, the, uh, the need for a kind of stand global, some global standards on measuring and comparing um, primary healthcare spending. But, but critically, this is also needed at country level to be able to compare 
what the subnational or local governments um, responsible for delivering primary care are doing. Um, so we need to be able to see what they're spending and what outputs and outcomes they're achieving. Um, and a, a key role for the Ministry of Health here is that the close monitoring of local government allocations to primary health um, and uh, local government performance on, on primary health. And then trying to think about how um, you can use the power of information and guidance to drive improved performance. And, and I do I do emphasize that because I think, you know, the importance of monitoring was was talked about in the report. But I think, you know, this this especially tends to be a weak area and one that, you know, is is maybe not um, not something that many ministers of health, especially ministers of health that may be used to a direct delivery role, take on easily. So I think it's also an area of potential sort of comparative weakness that, that often needs to be strengthened. Um, so as well as that, um, I also want to just finish with one area which um, I think the Commission usefully, and I do, do urge you to read the whole report, and the Commission use, usefully finishes with a set of questions which it thinks needs further research. Um, and I would like to add one of my own, and this is echoing a point um, Liesl made. And, you know, going on from the, the importance of local governments uh, managing uh, um, the PHC services. Of course, local governments are made up of the officials and the managers within them. And so we, I think we do need to know more about the state of managerial, including public financial management capacity at local government and facility levels and how it can be strengthened. And they need, to, they need that management capacity to effectively use the resources that are allocated um, to them, which is hopefully on some kind of adjusted capitation ba basis. Um, and in one sense, this is also people centered, but thinking about the people being the frontline and mid-level health officials who are operating, operating the system. Um, so thank you very much to, again to all the speakers and um, though, though that's the end of my mar remarks and um, look forward to discussing further in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Tom, for that. It was really insightful um, thoughts and, 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 dis and you know, interesting points also to take forward in our discussion as, as we move into this now. So again, thank you all panelists for fascinating presentations and thank you participants who have been starting to insert the, your questions into the Q&A box and to those who have responded. I think we're gonna start by um, perhaps um, responding to, uh, although some of them have been responded to, I think it'd be nice to pick up on some of them again in, in this kind of wider discussion. So Cara, if you don't mind, I'm gonna to turn to you first and I'm gonna uh, ask you to respond to two questions for two questions. So the first one, and I know you started to respond to this, but it'd be great to have some more thoughts, I think on this is how should the private sector be involved in primary healthcare? That's the first question. And then the second question is, could you please tell us what components should be considered to calculate the right amount of capitation for paying for, for paying the, providers, as Tom was also um, uh, referring to, and should it include the cost for more complicated treatment or just basic medical cost, or even of promotive preventive costs. And I was actually quite curious also in, in Eugenia's presentation when she noted how some things were actually excluded. And I was wondering what the process was also for excluding those kinds of costs, but maybe that's a separate question that Eugenia could address afterwards. But so over to you, Cara, for those first two. Thanks. Yeah, that's a two, a two really great questions. So um, you, you'll see that, um, that Nuria started to answer the private sector question. So I think one of the really important things is to distinguish clearly between private finance and private provision. And that's it. So I think you're drawing on evidence from around the world. We know really quite clearly that no country has got to universal health coverage with a predominant reliance on private financing, that public pooled funding is essential. And whether that's um, a contributory social health insurance system with all of the things that make that work well in terms of contributions for those who are outside the formal labor force, or whether that's through a tax-based system, I, I think the evidence is, is, is indifferent between those, but that um, is very different from private financing. And your private financing around the margins, again, your top-up insurance like they have in some countries, that's kind of fine. But the core of finance for the health system and for PHC needed to get to universal health coverage really needs to be public. Um, so then the question is, well, what do you do about these private providers? And I, I think that the, the private provision sector is it's really challenging because we know that in many countries, private providers are a really important source of 
of PHC services. Um, and in some cases, you know, well over half of services are provided through the private sector. And those, those, those private healthcare markets tend to be very heterogeneous. So there's a real mix of really great private providers and really terrible ones um, that are unqualified or semi-qualified and, and frankly, in some cases are quite dangerous. So the question is, how do you, as the government, um, make use of the good parts of the private sector that can deliver our services effectively? And to do that, if you start with my distinction between financing and provision, you need to find ways to channel public money to private providers. And that's about purchasing. And so I guess what we would argue is that, um, is that it's absolutely you know, that, that a, a, a system where you have really good quality strategic purchasing of services from the private provider. And by strategic purchasing, I mean being really clear on what the package is, being really clear on what the on who the providers that qualify for the system are, and then on what's the, the basis and level of payment, then that's absolutely fine. Getting to that system is something that's proven to be really quite challenging for low-income countries because the, the purchasing systems are, are very much emergent. Um, but I think as those, those contracting capacities develop, then that, that's what I would see as a trajectory with a more mixed system on the, on the provision side, but still predominantly having public funds. And so somewhere like, um, you know, and Lisa might be able to speak to this, you know, PhilHealth contracts private providers, um, and, and, and she might be able to, to pick up on some of the, 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 the advantages and some of the challenges of doing that. On what should be included in the capitation payment, this is this is really important. Actually, it goes back to some of the points that Tom was making about about defining the package. So, and that has a lot to do with what the fiscal envelope available is. Um, so, you know, the, the 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 service package that can be funded through these public funds will depend on the availability of resources. Um, so, I so the and that so so the the ex how extensive it can be will matter very much on fiscal capacity. And so I think what our position as a commission would be is that you start with what can be afforded and expand that as resources become more available. But um, Gregorius makes another point, which I think is also really important, is you can't think about provider payment for PHC in isolation from other parts of the system. Because indeed, as he points out, if, you know, the, if the package is too wide for the payment, then providers will recognize that their way to manage that is to refer patients upwards and so thinking about the broader um, the broader linkages in the health system what's the role of gatekeeping what's the role of patient or private and private in, or patient or provider incentives who go around the referral system that's all important and also thinking what is the where do the provider payment systems for higher level care and phc intersect so the, the, so that integration, that integrated thinking needs to work through the whole system. It, it can't be, we can't just worry about how to pay for PHC um, on its own. Thank you, Kyra. Maybe Eugenia, you might want to respond to my question since it's, it's kind of related to that, is why were things included and excluded in the capitation uh, model in, in Ghana? Like I think maternal care was excluded, why? You're on mute. Maternal care was excluded for two reasons. First, um, maternal care is provided by um, the smaller health facilities, and these are maternity homes. Maternity homes only specialize in maternal care. And so um, under the capitation system, the, the, the gatekeeper system, um, enrollees are supposed to select facilities. Um, they are not likely to be selected by enrollees because the other health facilities provide both healthcare, um, other healthcare, primary healthcare, as well as maternal care. So any rational enrollee will select um, other health facilities and um, will not select the, the maternal health facility. So it was not in the interest of the maternity homes. That is why they, they decided to remove maternal health um, care from the list. And then the second reason is that at that time, Ghana was trying to um, achieve the Millennium Development Goals and maternal health was, was high on the top. And there was concern that um, capitation could lead to reduction in the quality of care. And Ghana didn't want to risk that. So it was like, let's, let's 
take it out and see how quality of care will be affected by the payment system before we, we, we look at it again. So that is, these are the two reasons why it was removed. Thank you, Eugenia. And I'm, I'm just I'm going to, I know this is not in the correct order, but I, I want to continue still always ans asking Kara and Eugenia for responses to this question, which says, um, to successfully transition to capitation as a, as a core provider payment mechanism, supplemented by other payment mechanisms, to support people-centered primary healthcare delivery, you mentioned political um, stakeholder interest, information systems, etc. Could you talk about other challenges, especially regarding technical expertise that may derail adoption of capitation in many low and middle income countries? Who would like to start? The question was directed either to Kara or, or Eugenia, so one of you. Let me let Eugenia start with that because I think she has more direct experience with it than I do. I'll pick up any, I'll mop up anything that I can think of. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Yes, the expertise of stakeholders is very important. And that's one problem that Ghana had. Um, people didn't understand the whole um, capitation method of payment. And it was very difficult to convince providers, for example, um, what the difference is between the cost per encounter versus the cost, um, the per capita rate. You know, while the, cap the cap per capita rate divides um, the total cost by the number of enrollees, the cost per encounter will divide the total cost by the number of people who utilize healthcare. And so cost per encounter is higher than the per capita rate. And that was a very um, important source of crisis uh, in the, with regard to the capitation, lack of understanding. So the expertise of uh, well, training people to come to understand this is very important. And to get people who really know to train the stakeholders is a very important um, um, part in trying to implement capitation. Make sure that you have enough expertise in the system to, to get the thing going. Otherwise, the whole thing will just become a mess as we experienced in Ghana. So Fiona, I'm going to take the liberty of sharing my screen again, just to show this, because this um, this figure is in the report, and yes. I speak to these capacities on the bottom. So, um, so all of the capacities that are being asked for, so so information systems about um, you know being able to understand something about costs and something about utilization is really important. This purchasing capacity, even with capitation, there's still a need to you know to, to have those purchasing capacities. There's issues about provider. And it goes a bit back to, to Tom's point about who are the people in the system. You know, the providers are definitely people in the system and their capacity to manage finances and also the systems, you know, the choices about what what over what decisions providers can have autonomy and uh, and 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 the, the skills to manage that and then the PFM system. So in, in so that, that so there's lots of capacities there, but I think I also wouldn't be too discouraging about it because those that first step. Um, you know, from status quo to a per capita way of a per capita way of allocating resources doesn't take enormously sophisticated capacities across here. It's the kind of it's the further adjustments and then blending where the information systems are really needed. Um, the other thing that's interesting, and, that, and perhaps I know that are on this on this webinar that have much more experience. It's sometimes there's an argument I hear sometimes about um, one of the problems with capitation is that you don't collect that much information um, because you just pay without that link to outputs. And I think that's actually really important that you need to, you do need um, a health information system that does generate the information on those outputs and outcomes that Tom was talking about being able to monitor, um, you know, to monitor the impacts of expenditure. So I'll stop sharing there. Thanks. Thank you, Cara and Eugenia. Um, if you can all uh, mute yourselves again. Now I'm going to go back to Adriano. So I know there were some questions and also to Liesl, because there's, there's a related question we want to ask you. So I'm going to put the both questions to you. So Adriano, the question in the Q&A box said, asked you, recently the primary health network has been suggested as yet another way to organize primary health care, but we don't know whether all countries should follow this trend or not. I wonder if you can give any insight on why Brazil chose this primary care network pathway. 
And is there any change in financing arrangements to, to support this network? And while Adriano is responding, Liesel, I would also ask you to perhaps comment on, your, on the Philippines network plans and whether it effectively means a shift from managing primary health care at the municipal level to the provincial level. So if you can prepare that, Liesel, and then I'll, I'll start with you, Adriano, on your, on your response. Thank you. Okay, I'll start. Yes, go ahead, Adriana. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. So, uh, well, the I think we can divide the history in two moments. So, since 1990s and 2016, we have important period of uh, development of primary care based on uh, local experiences, and this local experience became national policies. Uh, but uh, the implementation in the municipalities uh, depend on the, uh, on the municipalities as a federal uh, system where the municipalities have autonomy. They can uh, implement or not uh, a national policy. Uh, why they most of the municipalities have implemented? Because they want to receive the federal incentives. So because of that, the family health strategy, and, and I think it's one of very innovative model. Uh, it's a multi-professional, uh, provide clinical assistance uh, and, and public health interventions. It's very comprehensive, uh, wide of actions provided uh, uh, for the population. Uh, was uh, implemented uh, as the most uh, uh, important model. From 2016 onwards, we are uh, in a period uh, that uh, uh, we are uh, in, in, in the under a fiscal austerity. And the Minister of Health for the first time in 2016 said, oh, we need to uh, uh, strength, uh, to uh, reduce uh, the size of the health system, uh, to fit the health system and the budget that we have and not to fight. In Brazil, we need to fight to have more public funds. Uh, I totally agree with Cara. Uh, we need to have public uh, funds to have universal health coverage. Uh, and the Minister of Health said, no, we, we not have any money, so we need to reduce. And because of that, the national primary care policy was changed uh, to fit only for the budget that we have and capitation was used as a way to address the, uh, to, to calculate intergovernmental uh, changes. So this, this, this change uh, is, has a national effect. Every municipality will uh, receive money under this new rule, the federal rule, but they, they have autonomy to implement or not the mode of primary care. They can implement or not the family health strategy. Thank you, Adriano. Over to you, Liesel, on, on, on the plans in the Philippines to shift towards a network, more network um, plans. Yeah, it is uh, the service delivery network is uh, one of uh, the key provisions of the Universal Health, Universal Health Care Act. And uh, it requires uh, or, uh, province wide organization of different uh, health offices at the municipal and uh, provincial level. No? On the other hand, for large cities, they can have their own uh, service delivery network within their you know, jurisdiction. Um, the concern is uh, there, the, the UHC did not rescind the autonomy of each of these local government units. So uh, the governance of this uh, service delivery network assumes that every unit will voluntarily join the SDN. There's a you know, preliminary scoping on the experience of the Philippines in, uh, uh, in organizing into SDN, uh, but uh, this is still very uh, early in the game and uh, you know, the achievement so far is on organizing, you know, uh, identify, uh, you know, signing up memorandum of uh, agreements, but the financing has to be 
fleshed out. Uh, and that is a major, major concern uh, to the uh, municipal health officers and even account, accountants, local accountants that we have talked to. Yes. Still Thank in the you. work. Thank you very much, Liesl. Um, um, I see there are no other questions from the audience. Please, audience, feel free also to put your hand up and, you know, take part or, or continue to post. I know, Cara, you have a question and indeed any of the other panelists would like to question the other panelists or to make comments, please go ahead. So over to you, Cara. Uh, thanks, Jess. This is a question for Tom. Because Tom, I really appreciated um, the point about um, kind of the visibility of expenditure at sub-national level and, and equally I think you're making the point that visibility of performance can be limited as well and so we kind of make that we make the argument that um that in more decentralized systems you need more tools not fewer that actually in order for the center to have um, have sight of what's actually being spent on PC. So can you think of um any country examples you know that have kind of used a, a set of tools to provide that um, that's oversight over spending, whether it's on health or PhD specifically at the subnational level. So, so I think I think um, you know it, it is often. So I, I mentioned it as a, an, an area I've I've seen it as an area of recurring weakness, and I think often you know it's seen as I think it's seen as almost like a reporting function. So it doesn't get the resources that it that it really needs but you know I think it's a for, for ministries of health I think it's a kind of critical analytical policy function that, that does need resources dedicated to it um, in in terms of you know often the first step is just to at least compile the finances properly um, and you know Uganda has done quite good local government financing reports where you can see you know um, you can see what all the health budgets of every single local government in Uganda are. Um, Kenya, in the in the transition to devolution, I know with donor support, put out annual um, county health spending reports so that you could see what each um, what each county in Kenya was budgeting. And I think I think those are the first steps. But I think you know um, uh, having the having the link to performance is the next step. And you made the you made the. Um, the argument about needing HMISs and needing these systems to be able to join up, and you know, just as you did with uh, in your in your presentation, comparing the kind of UHC coverage with with the amount of spending, I think you know that that kind of analysis needs to be done um, with um, you know with, with the individual local governments as well, so we can see at the very least what outputs they're producing for the for the funding that's going in. Thank you, uh, Tom and Cara, for that exchange. I understand from Cara that uh, that um, Sally Lake, and sorry to to jump on you, Sally, but that you are attending you here, and that you could talk about this experience from Tanzania. Are you there? Would you like to um, come forward and speak? Sorry. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll say what um, it's in, in the Q and A, which was in this response to how should governments disperse capitation payments to facilities, um, and uh, and Sally noted that um, there's quite a lot of interesting experience from Tanzania, um, including with direct facility funding, which is another way of another, another way of recognizing the bottlenecks in resources getting to getting to facilities. That's not always paid to facilities in terms of capitation, but I don't know if Sally is willing to, to share a bit about this, but she did note that uh, our colleague Gamini Mtai, uh, who works for APT in Tanzania, has lots of experience with this, but Sally, do you want to, would you be willing to report on, uh, on uh, your experience there? Hi. <laughs> yes, as long as I'm not with video. Um, no, you're not. Thank you, Sally. <laughs> we can't see you, but go ahead. <laughs> no, um, yes, well, Tanzania has had a, you know, a capitated formula for the health basket for many years, uh, which went to local government level um, and which started off as a, you know, a flat per capita amount based on what I think it was Danida could afford at the start but which has subsequently you know, brought in other sources of funding and been adjusted for uh, equity, for issues of accessibility. So the distance from the district headquarters to the uh, health facilities 
Um, now you have put me on the spot. And that has been extended in recent years to um, the health facilities. So now the grant that goes to each local government, each district council or municipal council, etc., is also then adjusted again to go uh, again on a weighted capitation basis to individual health facilities. And that, to my knowledge, is weighted according to um, some health data, some utilization data, some performance data. Um, Gemini is definitely uh, more up to date with this, but it's been captured within the mainstream PFM reporting systems, which I think are quite developed in Tanzania in terms of um, their facility financing. It, the mechanisms have also been extended uh, through to the education system and the school system uh, at local government level. So I, th I think there are, you know, there are potentially some some interesting examples there. And you know, the the health facility staff and the local government staff have had quite a lot of experience now in terms of managing the system. And one of the things that has come across a lot is this issue of you know where you know, where, where you pitch the autonomy and the flexibility for how to decide how to use those fundings. I don't think the system's perfect in any way, but I do think it's a, a good example um, you know, for some other countries to look at. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Keith. And can I just comment on that? Because the thing is that we are, you know, we think about capitation in, in, in systems like the NHS. Capitation is all... Um, ruled in with um, with registration, right? So you get a capitation amount based on the number of the number of individuals who register with a particular provider. And that's you know, that is that's quite an administration heavy system. But it is possible to have a capitation based allocation that is based on catchment populations. It works much better in rural areas where the catchment areas um, overlap less. I think it's much more of a challenge in urban settings to determine who, what really is the population that a facility is in charge of. But I think in, you know, in rural settings, you know, that's, a, that's a good first step. And on the basis of that, it is possible then to collect information and data that can inform not just the, um, the adjustment of the capitation, but also you know, how often it needs to be paid and how much movement there is and out and, and all those kind of um, adjustments that make the system a bit more um, sophisticated and responsive. Okay, thank you so much, Sally, for ju jumping in, and Cara also for, for managing that, that kind of dialogue there. I'm going to ask two more final questions now. So this, the, what, the first question, and I'm going to kind of ad lib a bit to this question, because this was also my question to you all. So the second question from the audience comes as, can communities really decide on what services should be provided, and how can they hold officials accountable? Any good examples? And I, I would kind of also like to add, you know, we're, we're talking very much about people-centered uh, approaches here. And I know, I think Tom mentioned, you know, people-centered from the tech, you know, from, from the providers, the technicians, the government people. But I kind of also want us to push us to kind of think about the, the end users. The, you know, how can we engage them more in these processes? Eugenia, you also spoke about, you know, lack of trust in the system. Um, you know, misinformation, miscommunication. So for me it would be, how can we really in involve community engagement in these kinds of processes as well? How can we kind of create a kind of, a, a, a kind of dialogue, a kind of um, discussion, kind of consultation process? And, and, and how would that work? So that anyone can, can respond to that question. And the, the, the final question I think probably will be targeted for you, Kara, again is, um, are there any insights on a good model to finance public health system functions in a primary healthcare system? Each country will have different public health models, but do we know what works and what doesn't? So I'm going to, that, Cara, you can answer specifically. Hopefully, hope you don't mind about that. My, the first question, who would like to have a go at that question? Okay, I can, I can answer the first question. Yes, go ahead, Eugenia. On how to dialogue um, and educate the populace. Yeah, that was a big, uh, that was an issue in Ghana. And um, I think the first step is even before you start dialoguing, select the right um, pilot area. Don't go for um, an area where there is political um, ramifications at the end. 
um, underneath the whole thing so that it will create unnecessary um, suspicion. So if you get a political neutral ground, um, people will look at the scheme neutrally. You know, there will be less suspicion. People will listen to what you have to say. But when um, there is already some miscommunication at the end, um, at the background, uh, people will listen to you with a pinch of salt. You know, and they will not um, listen to, um, believe what you are trying to, um, to tell them. So that communication or the educate, educating the populace is extremely important. Delink politics from the whole concept. And let us not overlook, you know, when they came to the selection of the Ashanti region, um, the argument was that um, Ashanti region is the largest and it's got um, a good balance of all the different categories of health facilities. It's got a good balance of the social um, economic um, municipalities and areas. So we have very rich um, um, districts as well as very poor areas. So it's a good blend of the, a, 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 like a miniature of the whole economy. Uh, but they ended, they ended up overlooking the impact of that political um, um, factor. And that is what ruined the whole thing. So the selection of the area is very important. And when that is properly selected, I'm sure people will really buy into it. Thank you, Jenny. Any thoughts from the Philippines and, and Brazil, Adriano and Liesl on, on this question, on how we engage communities, how, how to build trust and ownership and make it people-centered at all levels? Any thoughts? Adriano, you go ahead. Yeah. I think this is a part of the DNA of the Brazilian health system. The Brazilian health system has in the principle the social participation so in each municipality, in each state and a national level, we have national councils to uh, foster the participation of the population. And in primary care, the idea of having community health workers as part of the teams to do the linkage with the teams, with the family health uh, with doctors the nurses was really, really, really important. We have more than 4,000, 400,000 uh, community health workers spreading all over the country. So this is uh, this, this two organizational mechanism uh, works uh, uh, really well in doing this engagement. Thank you, Adriano. Over to you, Liesl. Any thoughts on that question? Yes, uh, we also have community health workers that assist the rural health midwives in delivering primary care services at the village level. Uh, in, in, at the policy uh, level, uh, at the local government unit, we have a representative of an, an NGO sitting as a member of the local health board. But how well does that voice actually re reflect the community is another matter. But there are structures that we supposedly uh, look into, you know, capturing the community voice in decision making. Thank you, Liesl. I think that's key. Although we may have these structures, exactly, are they, you know, how well does that move forward on that? Uh, Cara, I, happy for you to comment on that, but on this, but also then on the, the second question that we asked. Over to you, Cara. Thanks, Fiona. So I, I would um, draw your attention to the last section of the report, well, section six, before the recommendations. It does talk a lot about these, um, about the political economy issues. It does talk about possibly less about accountability, but more about creation, creating social movements in support of PHC and how, in fact, so much of so much progress in in, in the places that have really emphasized PHC has been because it's been possible to, to create you know, political um, coalitions and, and to move things in that direction. Um, in terms of the essential public health functions is such a good question. Um, so I did, um, I did spend some time trying to understand this. It was, it was particularly apt, I would say, you know, during, during COVID where we actually looked at you know, all kinds of different countries responding with different levels of effectiveness and wondering whether it, whether the architecture of the public health system mattered. And I, I'm by no means expert in that, but I did try to find out a little bit about how, how countries finance 
those essential public health functions. And my understand what I learned from talking to people and from reading a bit, I think it's a bit still an open question, is that there are lots of different ways to do this, as the as the the asker of the question says. Um, and and I think what's really important is that it's not so much who does them; it's that they all get done. And so um, having uh, you know, a clear stewardship of that public health, of those public health functions is, uh, is, is the most important thing to determine which things should be provided at the municipal level, which interventions should be provided at the facility level, and that kind of orchestration to make sure that everything happens is probably most important. Having said that, um, the, the beginnings of some evidence are being collected by uh, colleagues at the World Bank, actually, to partly inform um, these discussions around what is our, how do we make sure that our definition of PPP isn't just primary care? We are talking about the, the broader set of interventions, um, of, even of health interventions that encompass comprehensive PHC. And so they've done a, um, they're, they're doing a mapping of, um, kind of who provides and who pays for and how essential public health functions in a couple of settings. And those I think will probably be reported at the annual health financing forum in a couple of weeks time. Um, I, my own prejudice about that work is it, it will begin to, uh, to again, demonstrate to us the huge variety in the ways that these systems are organized, but that it's not yet going to push us towards any normative understanding of what's the best way to do it, because I think we're just beginning to understand it now, but hopefully with time we would be able to understand if there are some systems that perform better than others as a consequence of their financing arrangements. Thank you so much, Cara. I know we're running out of time, so I just want to turn very briefly to all panelists to have a few closing reflections in a couple of minutes. So, Adriana, over to you for a couple of reflections um, in a couple of minutes. <laughs> First, thank you for this uh, opportunity to be here. I think we can learn a lot with this uh, such uh, different experiences, uh, and I think primary care uh, is fundamental for have a universal health system. I think in Brazil, our history is to fight against social inequalities and build a universal health system is a way to do that. And currently, unfortunately, we are in a, in a, a, a civilizatory dispute. Where are we gonna go? Uh, if we're gonna, we're gonna have elections this year, I hope we next year we're gonna be in a better, <laughs> situation, but the current government uh, is totally against the idea of having a universal health system free of charge. And this is uh, uh, the way to don't have a, a strong primary care. So these recommendations are really, really important for the Brazilian context. And I hope we can do something here in Brazil uh, to spread the ideas in the recommendations in the study. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adriano. Over to you, Eugenia, for some final thoughts. Yeah, um, thanks again for the opportunity. And I will just make three main points. The first one is that to be able to effectively implement capitation, there is the need for the right budgets depending on the system, where it comes from, um, to build a good gatekeeper system. It's very important. Without that good system, there's no way you can have a good capitation method um, implemented. Another, um, the, uh, the second point I want to make is the education of the populace is also extremely important. This is necessary because it's important that the stakeholders take ownership of the of the payment schemes, our health system, our payment scheme. This is what is going to make it work. And we're going to put in all the effort that we, we have to be able to make it work. That ownership, that they taking ownership of the scheme or the method is extremely important. And it takes trust in the implementers to look to get that thing done. And the last point I want to make is that political powers are very important and should not be overlooked. Um, in selecting a pilot area, make sure that it doesn't matter how good that pilot area is with regard to health systems and other factors. But when the politics do not work in your favor, please look for a political neutral area for the piloting of the case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eugenia. Um, Liesl, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
the three things I, I think that resonated uh, from with me uh, with the discussion is that one, uh, who pays for what functions? Because the public health uh, functions that we uh, that has been mentioned overlap somehow with the primary care, and uh, you know the source of funding or who pays for that needs to be uh, clarified. And secondly, the lack of capacity or you know a need to, to to improve the awareness, for example, or the capacity of those who are deciding how to allocate the local budget uh, needs, you know, a clear guidance on, okay, so what we will use to ensure that we are actually budgeting enough or sufficient for, to deliver primary care services. And to do this, I think I would like to reiterate the need for a robust evidence to guide the uh, movement towards uh, implementing the Universal Health Care Act. Uh, the misgivings about pooling resources can be mitigated by cl cl clearly laid out data on who spends on what and uh, if that spending is actually contributing to better health outcomes for the population. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Liesl. Tom, some final reflections from you. Thanks, Rihanna. I think um, I I'm going to, I think some of the discussion has just uh, reinforced, but reiterate the two points, which I think, um, you know, are, are some uh, areas to pay attention to going forward from this, which is the kind of analytical and monitoring capacity in ministries of health, um, especially ministries of health that are stewards of decentralized systems of primary health provision, and the kind of managerial and uh, budgeting capacity at um, local government and facility le level, just echoing Liesl's remarks. Thank you, Tom. And Cara, over to you for your final thoughts and wrap up. I just uh, said this, it's been a real pleasure for me to bring this team together, because actually, although I met um, bilaterally with, I think, everybody here during the course of our, our work, it's uh, it's really been a delight to bring everyone together to share those insights. Um, I, I, I guess I would say also three things. I, I really appreciated Tom's appreciation for the the focus at the end of our report on the attributes of a people-centered financing system, because we we were really we really felt we had to be very careful about not being um, prescriptive, because countries are really different places in their journeys along this pathway. So to say this is this is a direction that we want to get to, and that there are lots of small steps that can be taken to start on that journey or to move incrementally along that pathway. I think um, that was something that we felt very strongly about. Um, and, and also the fact that there are lots and lots of different policy tools in the public financial management system that can be used to, to steer systems in that direction. And those kind of those technical tools are available. I would just, I suppose, just to remind about um, the audience about the, the last bit of our message was that these are these are also political issues and they often have to do with the redistribution of power and of resources between different groups, whether that's in uh, the case of provider payment or whether that's the case of between regions or uh, across regions, um, and between health and other things, between PHC and health. Uh, and so we mustn't be, I think, naive as to the politics of this and be prepared to help steer that as well as the, the technical solutions. Thank you, Cara. Um, it doesn't leave me much more to say other than thank you again, everybody, for your fantastic presentations. Really interesting discussion. I learned a lot. Thank you, audience, for your questions. I think some takeaways for me, as Cara also just said, is politics is everywhere and politics is very easy, can easily hijack all the best intentions. So if we don't work with all the different kinds of stakeholders and bring everybody together at all these different levels, I don't think we will succeed. So thank you so much for all your efforts and look forward to continuing discussion with everybody. Have a good day, good evening, good morning, everybody. Bye.